Bibles this morning, if you would. Luke chapter number 18. Luke in chapter number 18, if you would, in your Bible this morning. Thank you so much for uh, the special and the message of the special. And I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the music this week and the heart behind it, the preparation into it, and the content of uh, the music in which we've heard. It has been a blessing. Pastor Bell, thank you for allowing me to come. And uh, I've enjoyed being here. I've enjoyed uh, getting time with you and getting to know you a little bit and just rejoice with you uh, for God's blessing upon your life, family, and this ministry for 29 years. And uh, so grateful for what God has accomplished and grateful for what God is doing and what God will do. And uh, trust that God's got con continued to use uh, this ministry in a great way in the days ahead. Dr. Cox, I've enjoyed uh, getting to know you and uh, hearing you preach and thank you for the message you preached just a while ago and uh, such great wisdom shared uh, in the message that we've already heard uh, you know we heard sung last night God is the God of the day and of the night and sometimes God allows us in life to go through some things that we never would have anticipated but he's still God and he's got a plan in it and boy we heard a great message of instruction what do we need in a season just like that? And Pastor, thank you for it. And I appreciate the message I Cox last night and uh, just uh, challenging us about what the church ought to be. And uh, I stand in agreement with your message and everything that you said. There was one thing, Dr. Cox, that I did not agree with last night that you said. And uh, you said that you would not go into a Walmart in your pajamas for $10,000. <laughs> Now that I would do. <laughs> uh, we're in the middle of a building program, brother, and $10,000 would, would help us out just a little bit. So uh, if you'll give me the $10,000, you tell me what state to go to, and I'll go, and uh, I'll get through it, and that might help just a little bit. But anyway, I, uh, I've enjoyed it, and appreciate you, Dr. Cox, and the message and the wisdom. And just the spirit of the meeting. It's been a privilege to be here. Thank you for allowing my wife and I to come. Thank you for your gracious uh, hospitality of us. And Angel and Sarah have been such gracious hosts. And the meals uh, have been delicious and, and uh, more than we need. And the fellowship has been sweet. And just the spirit of being here. Everybody's been so kind and uh, so gracious and so welcoming. So thank you for that and allowing us the privilege to get to be here uh, with you in a part of this very special week. But we're going to look at Luke chapter number 18 in a minute. I truly want to be a help and encouragement this morning. Pastor mentioned that I'm a young man, and I am. And um, I, don't, I don't have the wisdom of a Dr. Cox, but I have a heart this morning to want to be a blessing to the church, uh, to want to help the good people here and the pastors and those that are here from other ministries that God might, through His Word, accomplish something in your life that would help you go forward for His work and for his name's sake. And that's my heart in this message this morning. Luke chapter 18, and if you would, look with me at verse number 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And I want to preach this morning on the subject of pride. The subject of pride. You know, I was thinking about the, the meeting and the revival flare and the anniversary of the conference and, and maybe what your pastor's praying and hoping will be accomplished through this and in the days ahead. And I was thinking, you know, you're never going to have the full working of the Lord if you have pride. Uh, pride is a great inhibitor to what God wants to do in our lives and in our churches. I love the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Of course, he's the perfect example in every way in his preaching and his teaching. And he often in teaching used parables. He would illustrate, he would tell a story. And in the midst of that story, he had a nugget, he had a truth. He had something that he wanted you and I to understand, to apply and to adapt and implement into our life. And we come into this parable and the Lord Jesus Christ is contrasting a Pharisee and a publican. Now, a Pharisee was a teacher of the law. This was a preacher. Uh, this was someone who knew the Scripture, and by vocation, they would teach the law. They would teach the Word of God. They were renowned. They were respected. They were well-known in the community, for sure. Then he contrasts the Pharisee with a publican. Now, a publican was a tax collector for the Roman government. So within the Jewish people, this was considered uh, someone who had betrayed right. their own. Right. Uh, he now is working for the oppressor. He's collecting taxes from us to give to them. I mean, this was Benedict Arnold in their midst, if you will. They did not like the publicans. And so the Lord's contrasting this Pharisee and this publican, and he's drawing our attention to this root problem of pride. Now, it is said that pride is the instigator of all sin. Pride convinces laziness that someone else should do it for me. Pride convinces lust that my pleasure comes before the purity of God. Pride convinces anger that if I don't get my way, someone's going to have to pay for that. Pride convinces gluttony that I better get my fill. Pride convinces greed that the more I have, the more I will be satisfied. Pride convinces envy that I deserve better than you. They say that pride is the root of every sin. Now, the American uh, Collegiate Dictionary defines pride as a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. Pride is thinking more of ourselves than God does. Pride is thinking more of ourselves than we ought to. And we often use terms when we're thinking about someone who is proud, like uh, they are egotistical or they are arrogant. They're selfish, they're vain, they're conceited, they're boastful, they're big-headed. And we could go on and on with the descriptions that we have for someone who is proud. Pride is an arrogant self-worship. It's the sin of exalting ourself and placing our interest above that of others. Man. That is pride. And pride destroys relationships. Right. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 10, Pastor mentioned it, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Yeah. What a powerful statement in the Scripture. Man. Only by pride cometh contention. Boy, pride oftentimes destroys relationships. A young couple, and they had been married just a, a few years, and it wasn't going at all like they thought it would. In fact, every day was a problem and a conflict and an argument and little things became such big things and they just couldn't get their mind wrapped around it. And finally they said, we got to get some counseling. Now, they weren't Christians and they didn't go to a Christian counselor, uh, but uh, we'll work on that a little later in the story. But anyway, and so they, they said, we got to get some counseling. And so they called and, and uh, kind of looked up a counselor that was recommended and <clears throat> got the appointment set and the day came and they went to to the office and then they were brought into an in, uh, a room and sat on a couch and finally a counselor walked in and sat down and he said well what seems to be the problem and the counselor looked at the husband and the husband just kind of shrugged his shoulders and slouched in his seat and and just didn't really have much to say didn't know what the problem was you know counselor didn't think he was going to get much from that so he looked over at the wife and he said well uh, what seems to be the problem and she just took off 90 miles an hour I mean she was telling him all the problems and all the things that were wrong with the relationship and what her husband wasn't doing and how he wasn't doing it right and and I mean she just let uh, the counselor have it of all the things that they were facing never took a breath just kept going and in the midst of this description of all these issues that their relationship was facing finally the counselor stood up out of his chair he walked right over to the woman I mean she's still talking he put her hands on her shoulders and he lifted her out of that couch he gave her a hug and he kissed her and then he stepped back and the woman just looked at him in shock. And the husband was looking at him in shock. And the counselor looked down at that husband and he said, Now, sir, that's what your wife needs. Twice a week, that's what she has to have. And that husband looked up at her, still kind of trying to figure out what's going on. He said, Well, I guess I could bring her here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so 
sometimes in our pride, we don't really see that it's us that have got to make some adjustments and do some things. Now, for all the unmarried people, that was not a Christian counselor. You don't do that in counseling, all right? C.S. Lewis said pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love and contentment or even common sense. And every one of us in this room are going to battle pride. Yes, sir. And we must understand according to the Word of God what is pride and how do we rid it from our lives and our relationships. And I believe the Lord gives us some great instruction found right here in Luke chapter number 18. And I want us to see first of all the root of pride. If you and I are going to get rid of pride from our life and relationships, we've got to understand where does it come from? What is the root of it? What is really spurning it on in my life so that I can rid it uh, from my life and relationships? And I see here, first of all, that the root of pride is self-righteous. It's being self-righteous. Verse number 11, the Bible says that the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God I thank thee that I am not as other men are. This was a self-righteous individual. This was his attitude. He said, I'm not as bad as the people in here. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like this publican over here, this traitor, this cheat, this tax collector. The Pharisee said, hey, I'm not too bad because I'm not like they are. Now, the truth of the matter is from God's perspective, the Pharisee was just like they are. Right. He was a sinner. Right. But he knew how to put on a better show than everybody else. And you and I have to remember in Isaiah 64, 6, that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Right. Right. Gabriel rule does not bring anything to God that is impressive. Right. In fact, God's instruction to me is if you want your life to accomplish anything, die. Every single morning, get up and mortify your flesh. Get out of the way. Let me work. Let me order your steps. And then something might happen. Amen. I don't bring anything to the table. When God called me into the ministry, he wasn't on the throne saying, man, now we're going to get something done. It was like, well, you know, here's a vessel of clay. It's not much. But if you'll let me work through and maybe something can be accomplished. But the Pharisee had a problem because he was a man of self-righteousness. Listen, friend, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You and I are not bringing anything to the table. This Pharisee said, hey, I'm doing pretty good because I'm not like them. Full of a self-righteous spirit. Some people get so caught up in their own holiness that they're looking for a vacancy in the Trinity. I, I mean, they're, they're, they are God's gift to the church. And they are the example for all others to follow. That's the attitude of this Pharisee. Lord, thank you that I am not as others are. Just think about the sound of that prayer. I don't know exactly how it all works in heaven. But if God even heard that prayer, I guarantee you it did not move the hand or the heart of God. Thank you that I am not as others are. Sometimes we have a great difficulty in honoring God because we are consumed with worshiping self. Man. We believe that we deserve praise. We believe that who we are and what we accomplish has not been properly recognized by right. others. Right. And the truth of the matter is this morning everyone us need to understand who we are. We are a sinner saved Amen. by grace. Yes. Right. The ground is level at the Amen. cross. Listen, the pastor and I were talking about Dr. Cox and the wisdom that was shared in the message and the background of the men on the platform. And, and listen, I'm grateful for the testimony that I have. I grew up in a Christian home. My daddy was a pastor. I was saved at a young age of life. I, I went to Christian school. I went to Bible college. I married pure. God called me into the ministry. I'm grateful for the life that I get to live. It's not a result of anything I did. It was what was handed to me. In fact, the verse where it says, where much is given, much is required, you could just kind of put my picture right there because I'm going to have a lot to give an account for someday and if I wanted to I could look around and say well I'm not like others but listen in the eyes of the Lord the ground is level to cross yep. if I got what I deserved I'd spend an eternity in hell yes, sir. 
That's the cost for my sin, Ephesians 6, or Romans 6, 23. So I'm grateful for the grace and the mercy of God. And sometimes we've got to step back and understand who we are. We're a sinner saved by grace. A CEO of a Fortune 500 company and his wife were taking a drive and just enjoying an afternoon. And they needed some fuel. And so they pulled into a gas station. And the attendant came out and was helping him get some gas. And the wife was kind of talking with him for a minute. And they uh, just kind of exchanging pleasantries. And through that, kind of figured out that they knew each other and tried to put a finger on it and figured out that this was someone that she had gone to high school with and had even dated for a short time. And uh, kind of unusual just to run into him in that way. And so kind of said hi and then got back in the car and got going. And the CEO got uh, in the car, was driving his wife there. And he kind of looked at her and she was kind of still kind of processing all of that, you know. And he looked over her and he says, I bet I know what you're thinking. She said, what's that? He said, I bet you're thinking I'm glad I married you or I might have been a gasoline attendant's wife. And she said, no, I was thinking had I married him, he would have been the Fortune 500 company CEO. <laughs> and uh, sometimes in our life we think it's me and it's really not. What was the root of this pride in this Pharisee? It was a sense of self-righteous. But I see that it was a sense of being self-sufficient. He says, I think, uh, uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. The Pharisee said, look at me. I don't really need anyone else. I'm just going to pray uh, myself. I'm just going to pray to myself and by myself. I can handle this. The, the Pharisee had come to a place in life where he was self-sufficient. All he needed was him. That's pride. When in our marriage we have problems, but we're too embarrassed to get help, that's pride. When we're struggling in our stewardship, but we're too self-sufficient to get some counsel, that's pride. When we're struggling in our relationships and in our home and parenting or work or whatever, but we're ashamed, we don't want anybody to know, that's pride. And this Pharisee had come to the place where all he needed was himself. He was full of himself. And that was the word of pride in his heart. A self-sufficient spirit boasts in what it has accomplished and what it can do. The message of that individual is, I can handle it. Whatever comes, I've already got what I need. I don't need anything else. What the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it, What's thou taken for dust thou art, and unto the dust thou shalt return. Friend, can I remind you and I that we are all dirt this morning? That there is nothing in and of ourselves to be sufficient of. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You and I have nothing to boast. You and I have nothing to stand on. You and I have nothing to work through life with. Our sufficiency is not in ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. And here was the man of God, the Pharisee, the teacher of the word of God, standing in the temple of God saying, I'm just going to pray to myself. I don't need anything else. Essentially, I have arrived. A man brought his boss home for dinner one night after work. His boss was a brash and an arrogant man. The man had a little boy, and the little boy sat next to him there at the dinner table, and they were just kind of enjoying company, and the boss uh, uh, just kind of talking about himself throughout the dinner and so on, and, and just being arrogant in this way. And finally he looked over at the little boy, and he said, Hey, why do you keep looking at me? And the boy looked up at him and said, Well, my daddy says you're a self-made man. And the boss kind of puffed his chest out a little bit and got a grin on his face and he said, really? Well, that's true. I am a self-made man. The boy looked at him and said, well, if that's true, why did you make yourself like that? <laughs> Friend, there's nothing in us that's going to get us through. It's not us that's going to get us through a time of shaking. Our sufficiency must be of God. Amen. But this Pharisee was a self-righteous man. He was a self-sufficient man, but I see that he was a self-centered man. Look at his claims in verse 12. I fast twice in the week. 
I give tithes of all that I possess. Uh, he, he begins to, uh, to say to God, I thank thee that I'm not as these other men are. And he goes on about his accomplishments and who he is. In fact, when you study the prayer of the Pharisee, he uses the personal pronoun I five different times. As he's praying, he's drawing attention to himself. I'm not like them. I don't do what they do. Here's what I do. Here's what I accomplish. Here, uh, how, how I have arrived. And his entire life was centered around him. Now, pride prevents you and I from truly helping others because we're too good to get our hands dirty. The Pharisee was on a different plane than everybody else. It's a self-centered man. Pride is the worship of self. It's a life that is all about me. The middle letter of pride is I. This is what happened when centered in the human race. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, when the woman Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and also gave to her husband and he did eat. Why? Because they saw it was good for them. Listen, friend, when you and I are living for the pleasure of self, we are living a life that will lead to destruction. And God was looking at this Pharisee and saying, listen, there's some root problems here. Uh, he's in a, a denial state of self-righteousness. He's arrived. He's in a place of self-sufficiency. He doesn't need anything else. He's got it all already. He's in a place of being self-centered. His life revolves around himself. Jesus took issue. With this Pharisee. We see the root of pride, but then I want us to see the reality of pride. Now, pride can be a positive or a negative. We don't often hear about the positive side of pride, uh, maybe endeavoring to be who God created you to be or to do your best with what God has given you. I was taught as a kid, take pride in your work. If you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability and, and make sure that you're doing it in an honorable way. And the Bible says in Galatians 6, 4, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have the rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And I believe that God wants us to do the best that we can with what we have. And God wants us to have a good name in Proverbs 22. And God wants us to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to Him because God's uh, life is God's gift to you and I and what we do with it is our gift pack to God. It was C.T. Studd that said only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. And so there is a positive side of wanting to do the very best that we can but there's a steep drop off to the other side of pride that we have to be so careful of. To make sure that we're not thinking of ourselves too highly as we ought to think. Negative pride is minding the business of others to the point where now we're in a constant mode of comparison and we're attempting to maximize ourselves and to put others down and we constantly build ourselves up as we criticize others. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, for we dare not make ourselves by of number or compare ourselves with those that commend themselves by the measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. God doesn't want you and I in a comparison race. God doesn't want you and I feeling better about ourselves because we feel worse about somebody else. Listen, friend, the standard that I'm going to be measured by is not seated in this room. The standard that I will be measured by is the book that I read in the morning. And when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, God knows. He's going to say, Gabe, I created you. I had a will for your life. I had a plan. I had something I wanted you to accomplish. And I gave you everything you needed to accomplish my will. I gave you all the time that you needed. I gave you all the resources that you needed. I gave you all the talent that you needed. Now let's see how you did. And that's going to be it. And I'm going to give an account for my life, my works, and my motives. And what I think about other people will not even matter nor enter into the equation at that moment. So I better be very, very, very careful going through life, comparing myself with somebody else and kind of jockeying for position or taking note of this or what is their social media status and how does it all measure up? Because I'm just telling you in the eyes of God, it doesn't even matter doesn't even factor in 
the Bible says they're not wise to be in this state of comparing among themselves. So this reality of pride, what is it? I would say, first of all, this morning, that it is deceptive. You see, pride lulls you and I into thinking that we are better than somebody else by comparing ourselves to them. And this is why God chastises you and I not to do it and tells us that it is a sin because when we put ourselves in that situation, we are really putting ourselves in the seat of God. We are now choosing who it is that is beneath us and we are validating why we feel that way and that's not our role in life, that's God's. Amen. Amen. And God said, be very de care careful because pride is very deceptive. The Bible says the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Pride is very deceptive because it looks on the outside and the trappings and the wrappings that, boy, if I do that, look at what I'm going to be. I mean, the Pharisee was an impressive person. The garb and the robe and the status and the clout and the way that everybody reverenced and revered and, and all of the uh, uh, privileges and, and the special things that went along with that. I mean, it would be easy to get caught up and to say, man, I want that. When Jesus looked at it, he said, you want to get as far away from that as you can. You're going to be deceived if you go after that because that's what pride is. It's deceptive. Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the person who has it. It's deceptive. But can we go a little deeper this morning? The reality is pride is not only deceptive, it's demonic. Pride came from Lucifer. He took pride in his perfection. He was the ultimate expression of divine beauty. He was the number two in heaven and the number one among angels. He was on the mountain of God in the ultimate position of authority. He walked with Shekinah glory of the fiery stones. He led in the worship of the creator of the universe and pride crept into his heart. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain to the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the right. sides of the pit. Right. Can I challenge you this morning, church? We are never more like Satan than when we are full of pride. Yeah. Pride is demonic. Every major mistake that has ever been made was rooted in pride. Adam and Eve ate because of pride. They wanted to be like God. The Tower of Babel was constructed because of pride. Right. They wanted to prove to God what they could do. Absalom would not reconcile with his father because of pride in his life. Judas betrayed the living son of God because of pride and eventually took his own life. Every major mistake, you trace it back to what? A root of pride. It's demonic. But I see it's destructive. Think with me this morning about the life of Samson. One set apart by God. One intended for greatness. But Samson could not shake himself from the self-centered pursuit of pleasure. What mattered most to Samson was Samson, which is pride. And when we think of Samson, we think of Delilah. We think of a man fastened to the wheel to ground the wheat with no eyes. We think about a little boy dragging him to the temple that he could be a spectacle. And thank God with his dying breath, he did a service unto the Lord. But ultimately, when we think about the life of Samson, we think, what a waste. What a missed opportunity. Right. Oh, what could have been. Why? Pride. That's what pride does. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. A man's pride shall bring him low. Pride is destructive. The root of pride, self. The reality of pride. But then I want us to see this morning as we close, the remedy of pride. How do we get victory over pride in our hearts? And friend, every one of us in this room are going to face pride. We're going to deal with it every single day. You know who my biggest enemy is in life? The man I look in the mirror every morning. Yeah. So how do I get victory over pride? Well, let's look at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 13, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven. Now the Lord is contrasting the Pharisee, the self-righteous, the self-sufficient, the self-centered man with this publican. And what do we see in his life? I see, first of all, he had a realistic view of himself. The Bible says that this publican, as he thought about himself, first he was standing afar and he would not so much as even lift his eyes to heaven. He said, you know what? Here's this Pharisee in the midst of everybody with all the cloak and the, and the demeanor that goes with it. And here's this amazing orator prayer. And here's this publican way back over here just with his head bowed. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you know what? I like something about that guy over there. I like his approach to this. Why? Because he has a realistic view of who he is. A deacon who was struggling with pride in his own life was a Sunday school teacher. And he was teaching a boys Sunday school class. And he was really working to implement and instill in those boys the importance of living the Christian life. And kind of telling him about his own life. And with some arrogance and some pride for sure. He said, fellas, why do you think people call me a Christian? Kind of an awkward silence, and one of the little boys in the back said, well, maybe because they don't know you. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to have the right view of ourselves. When we look at this publican, he had the right perspective of his own life. He understood that he wasn't self-righteous. The publican had no problem admitting the fact, I'm not bringing anything to this table. Uh, th that was a done issue for him. He knew that. He knew he wasn't self-sufficient. He didn't have it all together. He had no reason to be self-centered. He knew who he was. He came into church that morning in need of help because he was broken. Friend, I don't care what the exterior looks like. The common denominator in this room is we're all broken. The only thing good in us is the living Son of God. This man had a realistic view of who he was. The publican understood who he was to the point that he did not even feel worthy to look up. He knew who God was. And in light of who God was, in a realistic view of himself, he said, I just feel more comfortable looking down. I don't even feel like I'm worthy to look. The Bible says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Why? Because God giveth more grace to the humble. God resisteth the proud, but he giveth more grace to the humble. I'm not being mean this morning, but God is not as concerned about our applause for the preacher when we get started as he is about the bended knee when we're done. Amen. What, what, what is God seeing in us? Is there a realistic view of who we are? Jesus said, I like that. Standing afar off, his head down in humility. He knew who he was, and he knew whose presence he was in. Are we living in that reality this morning? Because we'll never get victory over pride until we understand who we are. Yeah, amen. But I see not only did he have a realistic view of himself, but I see that he had a responsible view of his sin. Look at verse number 13. And this publican standing afar off would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look at the contrast, friend. Here's the Pharisee looking at the church full of reprobates and saying, I'm glad I'm not like you, and I'm glad I'm not like you, and I'm glad I'm not like you, and man, I'm glad 
I'm way up here and here's this publican over here going God I, I'm so sorry for who I am and I think about my mistakes and I think about my shortcomings and God all I can say to you this morning is please be merciful Amen. the victory to pride in our life is a responsible view of our sin Amen. church God hates our sin and in love let me just say it this way God hates your sin because the problem in church life is we're so good at seeing the problem of others that we just skate right over our own problem listen it is my sin that put the Son of the living God on the cross. When Jesus died on Mount Calvary, it was for me. I was on his mind. The blood that was shed was to cover the sins that I have committed. And it's not your sins or your sins or your sins. It is my sin that put him on the cross. I better have a clear biblical understanding of how God views my sin. It makes him sick. And it makes him sick because it cost him the life of his only begotten son. Right, yeah. The moment when he turned his back on Jesus Christ and became as dark that nobody could see, I caused that. The prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I remember kneeling there. In October of 2015 in the Holy Land. And I thought this could be the place where the very living Son of God said, Father, I really don't want to do this. Let this cup pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know why that moment was necessary? Because of my sin. Because of me. Do I see that? Do I understand that? Because when I have a responsible view of my sin, it's going to help me get victory over my pride. It's going to help me to understand the greatness of God and the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we have to see our sin as God sees it so that we don't want any part of it. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy in the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. The publican understood. God, I have nothing to claim. No good do I bring. So I just want to plead for mercy. Because the publican had a clear understanding that someday he would stand and he would give an account of himself to God. A realistic view of self, a responsible view of our sin, but as we close, a reconciliation with the Savior. Look at verse 14. I tell you, this is Jesus, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted Jesus Christ was willing to freely give mercy to this man because he had humbled himself. Jesus Christ knew what that was all about. For the Bible says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. You know what Jesus was saying? I see myself in this man. The humility that he is giving an example of, the humility that he is manifesting, the humility that is coming from his life, that is what Christ looks like. Because that's what he did. Friend, people do not see our God in our pride. Man. They see our God in our humility. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know what God is looking for this morning? A humble heart. And if we, like this publican, like it is said of Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles, notwithstanding Hezekiah humbled himself, 
for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Why did God give mercy to this publican? Why did God give mercy to Hezekiah and to the people of God at that time? It wasn't their pride. It wasn't their accomplishment. It wasn't what they gave. It wasn't how many they ran in their bus. It wasn't how many Sundays they've come in a row. It wasn't the fact that they never missed soul winning. It was their humility that attracted God. God said, my mercy is extended in proportion to the humility that I see. The root of our pride is exalting self. The reality of our pride is an endless suffering. It's a destructive, deceptive, demonic life. But the victory of our pride is emulating the Lord Jesus Christ. May you and I learn from this parable. While the Pharisee looked like he had it all together, that's not the life we want to live. There's a lesson from the old boy in the back, the publican. And God would like to see a whole lot more of that in us. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning as individuals before you as a loving God to examine our heart and life. Lord, we understand that pride stands in the way of what you want to do, that pride is at the root of every mistake that we make. And Lord, if you're going to be attracted to this place and to us, it is our humility you're looking for. So Lord, help us this morning to just take inventory for a moment. How are we doing in this area of pride? Have we been deceived? Are we heading down a path to destruction? Lord, help us to turn around take a lesson from this old publican and to restore victory. May we see ourselves as we truly are. May we take responsibility for our sin and in humility help us this morning to reconcile with you. As the pastor comes, Lord, I pray that you would work as you did in our devote this morning.